Uh, so, yeah, thanks for having me here, for being the first one. Um, I may or may not actually address this title, um, but <laughs> I just wanted to see if anyone would show up. So, which is good, and you forced me to have a beer, which is also good. Um, so, what, I, what I've put together is, um, is a summary kind of uh, overview of some of, the, some of the things that we do in our lab. Um, certainly not exhaustive, but three main projects, I guess, if you will, that that kind of cover multiple scales. Um, before I begin that, I got a, oh, there we go. Um, just shout out to all of my crew, the folks in the lab, and, and all of uh, students, uh, past and present, that have, have sort of made this a reality. And like with all research labs, it, you know, it's not one person; it's everyone. So um, certainly have to uh, give give applaud to my team. Um, uh, where does it go? Well, that's weird. Never seen that before. Yeah. Okay. Let's try this again. Uh, so Eddie, you 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 were here with me when I went through this a few minutes ago, and it yeah. did work. Now it's not. So there's um there's something that goes here. No, there's not. But um, that's okay. We'll we'll get through it. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, I don't really remember what was here exactly, but something about technology probably, and the fact that um, that we have to uh, develop new ways and continue to uh, to move forward and, and improving what we do, and uh, that's going to help us uh, uncover uh, questions at relevant scales. I'm sure it was something to do with that. Um, sorry about that. I'd... Anyway, so one of the things that uh, that I guess I like to say about the, our group is that. We, we have a relatively wide observational domain. So this is, uh, this is a, a plot that looks at multiple scales uh, across time and space, uh, Stommel plot, if you will. Uh, and it represents the major processes that we tend to um, uh, appreciate or, or have interest in, uh, in in ocean and marine systems. And so it, it starts here at the, the individual uh, level, so very, very small spatial and temporal scales, all the way up to larger scale phenomena. And so I put this, this red box around this area that I call sort of our observational domain. And, and our lab is really focused on, on the application of, of technologies to ask questions related to these kinds of phenomena. Uh, and so we'll, I'll share a little bit about that with you today. So one of the things that's important for us is the ability to observe things. Um, and so we work in a, a suite of, of habitats or ecosystems. And the ability to observe things, of course, is going to be dependent on those conditions. So in an estuarine system, for example, as shown here, a tidally dominated system, you can imagine that observing something in the water could be really difficult. Um, whereas if we were to go to a lovely coral reef, let's say just down in the Keys, it could be fantastic until the lights get turned off, right? And then you don't see anything anymore. And so having the ability to, to um, make observations across all conditions is, is important, and I think it allows us to ask some interesting questions. And so ultimately it leads us to moving towards something other than just uh, observing things with, with transmitted light. And therein lies uh, the thing we'll talk about today, which is acoustics. And so I like acoustics. Um, we have two main types. I'm going to focus primarily on active acoustics. Um, so this is basically take your boat out, turn on the fish finder, and it starts pinging, and you see stuff in the water column. There are a couple different variants of this. Uh, we, have, we have what's called an imaging sonar, and this is something that really provides an image. You, it's, it's perceptible, right? You can actually interpret what's happening. There's fish here, there's a larger fish, a barracuda, in fact, chasing the school, and you can see, observe, and quantify this dynamic. Uh, the alternative is something more like, uh, like the standard fish finder, echo sounder you might see on your boat, where you can see the bottom, and you see these things in the water column, and you interpret those uh, based on your, your knowledge of the system. So all of it's great. It's, uh, it's a fantastic uh, approach, um, many, many benefits, some limitations as well, which, which we certainly uh, have to keep in mind. Um, but it allows us to describe the biological patterns. We can also describe the geological features or the physical characteristics of our environment uh, with sound. And so many of you do this, you know, generating multi-beam images. This happens to be one we generated um, from our autonomous vessel in the Arctic, and this is actually showing ice scour. Uh, where we have the imaging sonar and the multi-beam that's, that's been able to confirm this, and then we look at the fine scale habitat patterns of, of fish occupying these. Uh, so neat stuff, which I'm not going to talk about today, but happy to talk about it later. And then you have the other type, which is the passive acoustics, and this is really 
listening, right? It's what we all do. Uh, you listen for sounds in the environment. You can describe patterns of, of animal activities, uh, physical processes, uh, anthropogenic sounds, and so forth. Uh, and so those are the two primary ways of, of using sound uh, in, in ecosystem studies. And like I mentioned, we'll, we'll really focus on the active acoustics first. So there's three broad themes or projects that, that I'll talk about that each has its own scale. Uh, we'll start with an estuarine system, move into um, coastal fjord, and then finally out into the, the deep pelagic. And again, you know, this is really set up to, to try to think about asking questions that, that allow us to evolve um, in time and space scales, and, and each question can be a little bit different. But you'll notice that there'll be some overlap as we move through. So the first one is uh, taking us to uh, an estuarine system, tidally dominated system, and really the focus is trying to understand how do fish, nectin, how do they move in and out of subtidal, intertidal systems, and, and how, do you, how do you examine that? Well, first we recognize that this is a mosaic of habitats. All of these types of habitats exist within this space. Um, ecologically, they're very important. It's a very interesting and dynamic system, but again, one that's quite challenging to, to study. Um, there are some ecological processes that are important, particularly connectivity, and we re realize or recognize that connectivity among these habitats can be controlled by the physical dynamics, right? And so being able to, to accommodate that in your observational approach is important. And, and these are principally the things that, uh, well, down here, these things. These are the things that, that we recognize as constraints that, that might dictate or, or mediate these processes. So it's important to kind of think about what may structure those patterns that we see, but also we have to recognize that, that individuals have the ability to mediate these important processes. So trophic dynamics, production, transfer, even biogeochemical cycling. So individuals within a system can mediate these. And so they, of course, probably happen at small scales. So understanding that small scale dynamic is really important. But you then might say, well, how would you observe that in such a challenging place? And that leads us to the study. So we're really interested in trying to understand how, how do nectin move in between the subtidal intertidal area, right? This, so this area of exchange, how do things move? We realize that that happens because there's a host of, of studies that have done this. Um, but the fine scale stuff is what we're really interested in. And so first we set the stage with the physical characteristics. So high tide looks like this. This is what it looks like at low tide, right? Very, very different system, very dynamic. And of course, when these are your two endpoints, well, you've got to measure everything in between as well. Uh, in addition to the fact that you can't see through the water. So what we know to date in trying to characterize what a nectin community looks like or how dynamic it is, is the ability to physically capture something. So you got to catch it. In many cases, you probably kill some of it, um, which I try not to do. So we apply other technologies. But with this approach, you have the ability to, let's say, cord off part of this, this channel, and you can sample it. You can sample it uh, frequently, every 10 minutes. You can sample it daily, hourly, whatever the case is. But that's going to let you know who's coming, who's going. Right? But that's kind of the, the extent of what you get. And so um, Brett and Allen came up with this really extensive analysis where they were, they were opening and closing these every 10 centimeters of the water. So as the tide's coming up, they're opening and closing it or sampling what's in the net. And so they got this really interesting community dynamic as a function of water level. But what you don't know is how are they interacting with each other. You don't know how they're interacting with the habitats around them. Um, you just know that they're there and you know that they change over time. And that's the extent. So we recognize that, but want to move forward and try to do a little bit more. And so this represents uh, an imaging sonar that's placed in this area where you're looking across the water column. I apologize for the resolution. It generally looks better than this. Um, I blame my beer. So uh, this is the sonar. We're looking across the water column. This would be the marsh edge. And what you see moving in here, uh, again, which generally looks a lot better, these are schooling fish. So these are actually juvenile menhaden moving through. And then you can see larger predators, small cyanids that are moving through and disturbing them. Right? So this is, this is something you would not see with a net. You would simply know how many pass through for some amount of time. And so we can actually now quantify these. We can measure them, track them, count them, look at their interactions, all kinds of behavioral questions which we didn't have access to before. And if we like to think about other things, we can see turtles moving through and dolphins for you know, people that like those charismatic animals. Um, and so this is a really 
it's a, it's a it's a platform that that we can gain a lot of information about the the ecosystem without really doing any harm or, or being non-invasive. So some some basic things that we've been able to come out from this study is at first is just to notice if we were to think about two functional groups breaking things down into predators and prey, right? So two functional groups based on size, and then breaking that down further into who's occupying what part of the habitat. How do they move between day and night? And so we can see clearly there's some some interesting shifts. Um, between uh, the, two, the two groups and notice the difference in scales. So many, many more prey than predators and they tend to like channel better than edge. So if I had two small nets and I put them out there and I sampled them, I would have known the same thing and not had to spend the 100 grand to buy the sonar and have the same answer, right? Uh, but fortunately, we can, we can do a little bit better than that. So with our, with our approaches, we're able to have a continuous data set, so observing continuously across many, many um, tidal cycles. In our case, it was about 78 hours, just to see, would this work? Can it work, and can we apply these approaches to other places? So what we see is prey and, and predator. Um, this is uh, prey scale, predator scale over there, with prey being in blue, predators in orange. And so we see that, well, interestingly, there's some, there's some patterns that immediately jump out at us, which, um, which are good we can see that there's some fine scale asynchrony between these. So suggest that the predators or the prey show up just a little bit before the predators. Um, notice interestingly, they tend to peak, their, their abundance or density peaks at lowest water level. So within about half a meter or so in that, in that interface is where we see the peaks in prey. And we can think then about the variance. How does, how does the variance in their densities change uh, through wavelet analysis? So this is, the top is the same, same plot you saw earlier, basically just showing the, the peaks in, in density. And then we have the prey and the predator uh, wavelet response. So this basically summarizes the variance that we see in those, in those patterns across time. So this is period in hours. So if you were to think about what are the dominant periods of variation in our data sets, um, and we can see it. So clearly, there's some patterns. These are, these are observable, as we can see here, and leads us to think about what important processes may be driving uh, the distribution in, in fish that we see here. And so in this case, we've highlighted that there's two main periods, a dial and a tidal cycle, which aren't surprising in a tidally dominated system, and one in which the sun comes up and goes down every day, right? So fortunately, we were able to pick these out and, uh, and also notice that the variation that we see, the greatest peaks in variation, which you can now look at this way, um, again, correspond to low water levels, which is, I think, pretty telling if we want to think about how the ecosystem is structured and how these organisms, these nectin, respond to each other, each functional group, and then also the habitat types. So we can take this a little bit further and decompose this into, um, uh, to consider the coherence between these groups. And so this is, um, this is a plot that, that shows the patterns in the predator and prey or between them, the coherence between them. And so the directions provide insight into how these, uh, these interactions are structured. And so those two dominant patterns that we saw are the dominant scales, uh, the 12 hour and six hour show up here. And what we find is generally the, the arrows are pointed in a way that suggests that these guys are, are varying uh, in phase for the most part. Um, and they're generally uh, occupying or, or they're, they're, they're responding to one another in similar ways. But what we find is that in the shorter scales, the shorter temporal scales, uh, based on this, which I think is the interesting part, it seems that they're not necessarily coherent, uh, that the prey are leading the predators. And so one may then begin to think a little bit more deeply into this, and, and of course I didn't do that because we didn't have time, um, but it suggests that there may be some processes that, that operate at smaller scales um, to, uh, to describe uh, you know, maybe top-down or bottom-up influences. We can think about what might be structuring things at, at the less than two-hour scale uh, between these, where prey may be responding whoop, to, uh, to something else uh, out of phase with the predators. So, this is something that we're, uh, we're, we have out right now in review, hoping to, uh, to get some, some more insight. If anyone has ideas on things that might be relevant at less than two hours in, in estuarine systems that are tightly dominated, that would be pretty cool to talk about. Um, one of the things that we've developed through this and because of this is some tracking uh, algorithms, which now will actually take this further. So before, I had an army of undergraduates 
measuring and you know Steve knows about this right you know you uh, you say here's some video I'm sorry it's gonna be painful. it'll take you about two years good luck uh, and so the data set that I've just shown you came from that and so what we've now have is the ability to to identify and track these organisms we're, we're still refining the method but the hope is that we can now take this and, and actually plug it back into to the entire data set and see how similar uh, things look and, and what other questions at finer scales can we ask. So first of all, we supported the results at some level for what we saw with the, the net, um, but we have a continuous data series that, that now allows us to ask some other questions that, that may be more interesting. Um, and think about the, the scales of um, uh, variation across these uh, functional groups. And it lets us now think about how can we use this technology that's non-invasive that we can quantify processes to ask some of these other questions um, that may be more important and particularly in thinking about habitat restoration, protection, um, and you know, and other things that may be relevant to, uh, to folks in, oh, that's weird. Um, in, in other areas. Okay, so apparently we transition to this now. Uh, <laughs> all right, so the, the middle scale is now focusing on um, effects of, of humpback whales, so large conspicuous predators on schooling fish. So we're now sort of groups versus groups um, at the aggregation level rather than thinking about individuals. So we've been working in Alaska for many, many years now and uh, focused on this interaction because it's, it's quite interesting. The, Whales are, are considered to be significant predators. They consume a, a tremendous amount, about uh, almost half a ton of herring per day, per individual, right? So it's, a, it's an enormous amount of consumption that occurs. We put that into context with the fact that the population is growing. So they continue to grow. This is an outdated estimate. Um, and it's expected to be even higher than this now. And so as the population grows, what impacts may exist on, on their prey sources? And so you take that and then you put it into context with the other predators that are also around, uh, which is one of the things we're interested in. How do whales necessarily facilitate extra predation or um, the, uh, the benefits that whales by predating on, uh, on herring, are, what benefits do other organisms receive? Uh, basically that uh, opportunistic eating. So here's the situation. Um, in wintertime, herring, Pacific herring move into the inland waters, the fjords. They move in there to prepare for spawning. So they're, they're going into these relatively quiescent areas. Um, it's energetically favorably, or favorable, presumably, and they're there to provision for spawning, which will occur in early spring. And so they come in and they, they hole up and, and wait, basically. But at the same time, we have the humpbacks that are provisioning, preparing for their migration south. And so there's this interesting trade-off where the herring have this behavioral need, if you will, to save energy, generally be at places that are, that are lower energy um, systems, so for example, bottoms of canyons, instead of being up in the water column dispersed as, schooled, as schools. And so the, the interesting thing that we see here is that we think that whales are actually acting to disrupt the, the schools of herring, of course, because they're foraging on them, which then makes them susceptible to foraging uh, by other organisms. Uh, particularly stellar sea lions. So to kind of think about this a little bit more or ask these questions, we did a series of surveys. This was early on, so this is now our baseline. We're actually repeating these surveys now uh, to try to think about what may have changed. It seems that the, the herring population is, um, has had some issues lately in the last few years, and they're, they're, not, they're not doing so well in trying to understand what linkages exist between them and, and, uh, and the whales. So we did a suite of acoustic surveys um, to estimate the, the biomass and the spatial distribution of the schools themselves, and then coupled that with um, population estimates uh, through uh, mark recapture of, of the humpback whales in the area. And so those two correspond in time and space and allow us to then, uh, excuse me, uh, think about how do these two overlap and, and what are the interactions um, that, that exist between these two. So, Unfortunately, we didn't have acoustic surveys. This is 2007, uh, the winter 2007, 2008, as an example. We didn't have an acoustic survey here, uh, but we did have a whale survey. And the circles represent the whale abundance, as you can see with my hokey scale over there. Um, and then we have the herring biomass that's represented by the, uh, the, the color map. 
So you notice that whales are quite abundant. Um, anecdotal evidence, evidence suggests that the herring were, were present here and looked a whole lot like this, but that was based on um, NOAA's little fish finders, not uh, an acoustic survey of, of, of um, well, not an appropriate acoustic survey. So we don't have that data to show. But what we do notice is that there's some interesting relationships. So herring are beginning to come in and coalesce in areas. When whales are abundant, they tend to be right on top of the herring. Um, and as winter progresses, the whales are going to depart and the herring are going to basically pack in, uh, increase their density and sort of coalesce into these overwintering schools preparing for spawning. And here is the problem, is that in the wintertime, you have the herring that are up in the water column. They don't really want to be there. They're not necessarily feeding. It's not that they can't feed, but they generally don't feed during this period of time. This is, we believe, where they want to be. And so in, in November, early winter, they're up here, which is also the time where the whales are doing their, um, their highest uh, rates of feeding. Once the whales have departed, the herring move in. So these are the herring schools sitting in the bottom of the, the channels, just literally packed in there waiting for uh, spawning season to come. And so we've got these vertically and laterally dispersed schools in the early winter, and then these um, uh, very densely packed coalesced schools in the, in the late winter. And what we notice is that when we think about uh, the whale population estimate, so this is whale days. This is a, a metric that came from, uh, it's, a, it's an index of, of whale abundance from the mark recapture model. So this is, think of this as our, as our population estimate of whales. And so as you can see through the, through the winter, as it progresses, there's a precipitous decline in whale abundance. Makes sense because they're heading down to Hawaii to hang out in the sun. Um, we compare that with the mean school depth. So if we look at the mean depth of all the schools distributed in the water column from the acoustics, you can see this interesting relationship that exists where when whale days are really high, that is when there's a lot of whales present, the schools are up in the water column, which is where we think they don't actually want to be because it's costly. Um, they're basically running for their lives all the time. Um, and then, of course, as the whales move out, as they depart the area, um, the, uh, the schools move deeper into the water column, which is where they should be. They don't, they don't relocate. They just get to move down finally. And here's a, another interesting relationship we see in that with, um, with, with this progression of winter, as seen here, um, we notice that this is the school depth. So two examples, these are just two locations within our, um, within our, uh, our survey area. Um, this is the max depth noted here with the dashed line. So that one's uh, 130 or so meters. Um, herring school depths here, 